So hello and welcome to MediaTek Upstreaming from Ring Up to Task Coverage. I'm Angelo Joaquino del Regno, but please call me Angelo. I'm a software engineer working for Calabra, and I've always been working on Qualcomm SOCs. Hey! <laughs> then, well, I, I started going with Chromebooks and MediaTek SOCs. Um, yes, MediaTek, really. Um, this is because Apparently, um, there is um, not a huge community around MediaTek, despite, um, well, in comparison to the Qualcomm community, at least. And it's, for some reason, not really well known. So let's start with some, gap, uh, some background uh, around MediaTek. Um, so it started with OpenWRT people um, upstreaming rallying SOCs, which were uh, MIPS architecture, um, that MediaTek acquired Rallying in 2011, and as you know, MIPS is dead, so now it's all ARM and ARM64, uh, that's the same for rulers now. And then shifting a bit forward, um, yes, a white laptop appears, and these are Chromebooks. Uh, with the first MediaTek Chromebook uh, being released in year 2016, with a pretty old SOC, um, it got fully, almost fully upstreamed in, by more or less year 2020. Um, things have improved quite a lot um, with a current MediaTek Chromebook, which got released in 2022, so really recently. And right now it's upstreamed. It just misses some uh, external display support and literally nothing else. And yes, uh, MediaTek devices are literally everywhere. Um, it's easy that you probably <laughs> have some, some MediaTek smartphone uh, somewhere in some drawer um, with probably some Chinese El Cheapo device, you know. Uh, these are really, really common, which are basically the, the, the same device, but um, in a different shell, but it's ultimately the same board. So you, maybe all of you have the same device. <laughs> Regarding MediaTek and Upstream, there is a relatively small community around it, as I um, said before, uh, because the vast majority is on Qualcomm. Um, and it would be really nice if um, we would see more people on MediaTek smartphones trying to Upstream them, because uh, um, you know uh, that would enrich the Linux kernel and the ARM and ARM64 support beyond just basically the, the usual um, SOC manufacturer. Because then, yeah, there is a myth for some reason um, for which MediaTek SOCs would be slow. That's not the case at all. Uh, if you look at the latest uh, Dimensity chip, that's beating the Snapdragon Gen 2, so, you know. So let's go for some real action. Um, we'll start light with some hardware tools for both uh, bringing up both uh, Chromebooks and smartphones. You obviously need a power supply, um, unless you have something that doesn't require power. I don't. Um, you, that's important for uh, taking care of your battery other than actually powering on your board. Um, that may look obvious, but if you choose the wrong one, you will encounter countless issues. And getting to something more interesting. Yes, you need to, of course, find a UART or uh, some way to actually check the kernel logs because that's obviously uh, your only way to actually know what's going on. And at least for Chromebooks, there's a SUSE cable that is a type, a, uh, type C to type A or whatever. Um, that um, will expose three UARTs uh, so that you can um, actually check both logs from the embedded controller and uh, the AP, in this case, the MediaTek SOC uh, running Linux. And unfortunately, there have been some shortage uh, issues for this kind of cable. Um, but no fear, because even debugging tools could be open source. Thanks, Google. Um, you can actually make your own. Uh, you just need a breakout um, Type-C, um, a Type-C breakout board, 
and some resistors, and basically that's it. You may require some soldering um, abilities, but you can even breadboard one, if, uh, even if I don't really recommend doing that, but that's possible anyway. And regarding smartphones, uh, yeah, uh, I had to actually solder and, <laughs> well, find and solder uh, teeny tiny wires to actually find that you are at port, and that's from a smartphone that I have recently upstreamed, featuring a MediaTek um, Helio X10 SoC. Um, you don't really require actually soldering skills even for that, because um, you can easily poke at the pins. Uh, it's uncomfortable, but you can do it. It looks scary, but once you actually pop off that cover, it's, you know, it's not that, that bad. You just navigate through it and you'll eventually find it. It's anyway a 1.8 volt signal, so it's easy to find. And let's go for some software tools. In the case of Chromebooks, you have a reference downstream uh, kernel source code that is usually not too old. Um, it always includes uh, Git history and this means that you can actually see what's going on. Um, it's publicly browsable at uh, Google's repos. Um, <clears throat> and in case you unfortunately uh, do something that is really, really bad, uh, you can re recover the Chromebook. Um, there is a Chromebook recovery utility that only, unfortunately, only runs on Windows and Mac. Uh, that is a Chrome extension. Um, but if you are a developer, probably you don't really need automated tools, so you can go on your own on Linux. Um, there's Chrome in Dash, on which you can, from which you can download um, your um, recovery image, and you will have to DD it on um, a SD card or any kind of external USB mass storage device, and it's as easy as inserting your um, USB mass storage into the Chromebook and start the recovery process. It just goes on its own. As for smartphones, uh, the story changes a bit, um, where the, your reference uh, kernel source code is really old, if you can even find it. Um, it rarely includes the Git history because it's a copyleft tarball drop. And of course, if there's no Git, it's not browsable. So you will have to download a gigabyte of stuff to check on 10K, but developer's life. Um, as for recovery, uh, that's also a bit harder because um, very, very old phones don't really have fast boot, um, at least on MediaTek. Um, then it, Google started actually reinforcing that so everyone has fast boot. Uh, but in case you will have to find a recovery image which is not granted you, um, it's, it's, it's not like you go to the OEM's website and download one. Uh, that's not how it happens. So good luck finding one. Uh, you can find uh, something. I won't tell you how, but you can imagine. Uh, you can find it in shady places. <clears throat> Let's go for development tools. Obviously, you need your hands, um, of course. A text editor across tool chain, unless you are building ARM64 for ARM64, on ARM64, and a lot of patience, not just because you have to wait for that thing to actually build, uh, but because of the many issues that you will have later. And then, yes, uh, you should never underestimate, like I did, some scripts and commodities that will help you through your development journey. Because we all want to just go there, implement our thing, and just see it working. That's not really how it works. Um, that will actually make you lose a lot of time. Um, if you care about building your um, development environment and making you comfortable, you know, uh, in that, that will save you a lot of time. Let's check some. For Android, you, of course, it expects a custom boot IMG. Um, I'm saying nothing new, probably, um, but it's a bit, you know, not um, not really straightforward as uh, copying a kernel binary and booting it. Um, you need to know some parameters from your bootloader because it 
expects the kernel to be at a certain um, memory address to actually jump to it. So um, you can easily find these parameters by um, disassembling, actually decompiling, not decompiling, but um, you can read these parameters from uh, your device by pulling the boot image for your device. And um, and then for well, Chromebooks, yes, but basically everything. Actually, uh, it's not really uh, only related to Chromebooks. Um, we have uh, some some scripts at Calabra uh, that are public and open source, and they will always be public and open source. Um, the advantage is that everything would be in one folder. There is no system-wide install required whatsoever. Uh, it will automatically download your tool chain, set it up, manage any kernel configuration fragments that you don't want to be into the kernel tree. Um, and yes, it also helps you to verify the code and bindings, build, and if you let me use that word flash um, on an external storage device um, for easy booting, this would also work with smartphones, actually. The scripts are available at the Collabora GitLab, and you're free to use them, contribute, do whatever you want. And yes, I'm saying something obvious here, maybe, but there are some people that really don't use Checkpatch. They, they forget about it for whatever reason uh, before sending a patch upstream. And a good way would be to actually automate it. Uh, it may be annoying sometimes while developing, but if you automate it and get past that annoyance, that will guarantee that you have run check patch. So please do. Get into something more serious. Um, there are times in which you're trying to optimize uh, code size while developing your driver or doing a, perhaps a huge restructuring of something <laughs> of some driver in the kernel. Um, there's the Blodo meter who, what, which helped me a lot in, um, in actually uh, performing a big restructuring that I've done for MediaTek clocks. Um, and it's, it's actually easy to use. You just build the kernel or um, with, of course, all your drivers, save the old uh, binaries that were compiled, make your changes, build again, use the Blodo meter, which will compare the uh, actual uh, binary size uh, between the old one and the new one, and so that you will know if um, you are just reducing the, the code size or the actual binary size. Because smaller is not always better. It's not granted that if you have less lines of code, the binary is smaller. That's totally not granted. And Smash. Smash has helped me a lot. That's the lifesaver of the tired engineer. Uh, <laughs> when you actually make some uh, you know, stupid mistakes, it happens to everyone. Um, there are some tools with, like Smash, and with static analysis, you can actually mm, avoid a lot of stupidities. Uh, but now let's actually bring it up. So, of course you want some serial, um, as I said before. Uh, you want a pin control driver, because um, you have to switch those pins to actually be a UART port. You maybe need some clocks, and obviously a device tree. If you want to go to certain lengths, then you can also um, Get out of the early bring up with some regulators, support, and that's, that would be required for EMMC and SD, and of course for the display. So let's check something about the UART on, on MediaTek. Um, well, as you can see, the downstream uh, device tree node is a little, you know, um, unusual, maybe? Um, you don't really have to um, have support in Linux for your um, UART um, IP. 
because if, uh, if the bootloader leaves it open uh, before booting Linux, which is most of the times the case, uh, you just need to know where to raw write your um, random characters, which would be your kernel log in that case. Um, that would be slow, but effective, I would say, because that would be anyway the only way to get knowledge of what's going on in early bring up. So why not? Let's get on with pin control. Um, that's a um, bit of pain and suffering, because on um, older kernels, that's like you find uh, code that is apparently random. Uh, it's, it's not really pleasant, but uh, if you get your grab skills um, going, then you will actually find everything that you need to actually bring up, um, to actually write a driver for upstream, because the, the information, even though it doesn't appear to be all there, it is all there. It just takes some time to actually find, um, find it. And luckily, though, um, if you get something that is more modern with a downstream uh, MediaTek kernel that is more or less 318 or something newer, that's basically a 60 minutes of work uh, because it's basically the same as upstream. You, of course, need to fix this and that, but the format is the same, so. And, of course, you can see a... Um, an example of downstream uh, up and downstream, oh, uh, sorry, <laughs> of upstream down and downstream up. Um, you can feel the pain. That's a 3.10 kernel, by the way. <laughs> same for the clocks. Um, it's still the same pain and suffering, and it's still the same 60 minutes of work uh, for 3.18 onwards. Um, but again, the information is always there. Um, people are always scared about uh, checking that, uh, in, that in, finding that information on old kernels. They often think that there's, the, the information is not there, but it is there. You can find it and you can literally, if, if you get mm, smart enough in navigating that uh, downstream stuff, you can actually write an upstream driver in no time. And the device tree. The device tree downstream is uh, your primary source of information. It contains something that is really odd compared to the upstream ones, because you can find basically the entire um, IO space layout uh, in one node many times. So that's really convenient, and I mean, you will just have to, you know, translate this and that to upstream language, and well, making it proper actually. And that's about it. If you want to go to different lines, um, it's always um, always the same pain and suffering when you are looking at old kernels uh, for MediaTek. Mm. Also because the, the code is also a bit subpar, honestly. Um, and it's, again, always the same for 3.18 onwards, where MediaTek actually started to use the upstream drivers uh, in their downstream kernels. So that's way more convenient. Of course, um, if you want EMMC as the support to actually make your platform useful, upstream, you will need some regulators, which may be scary, but I mean, if you, if you take the right precautions, take your time, you're not going to release that green smoke. This is spe especially required for EMMC, where you have this uh, voltage signaling uh, switch from 3.3 volts to 1.8 volts for the HS modes, uh, high-speed modes. And um, I can give you one recommendation. Um, which for some may be obvious, but no optimizations yet. Uh, there are too many people trying to just do everything in one shot. 
everything's just perfect, just spot on. That's, that's not how it works. First, you have to get it working. It can be dirty, that's a thing. But it's better if you get something that is actually working um, in, than, than uh, actually getting failures fast. So first do it, then you clean it up. It's fine. And well, besides, even if um, on trading, they act, uh, MediaTek actually uses um, upstream drivers, basically, it's never really just a copy-paste job anyway, because the code is always um, a bit dirty, you know? But it's probably easier to read. That's a plus. Test coverage. Test coverage has helped me a lot. And it's way more important than you think. So there's the kernel test robot that everyone has encountered in their lives, I'm sure. Um, that's, uh, that's actually complaining because you are testing your code on ARM64 if you're, uh, you're compiling your code, sorry, for ARM64 if you're developing for ARM64. Uh, you don't really care about Spark or um, x86 or other architectures. Um, but the test robot does. And kernel CI, um, which monitors Linux stable, Linux next, and also more, uh, monitors the Collabora's MediaTek integration kernel, which is always an um, upstream-like kernel. We will talk about it later. And it does test on the real hardware. So the zero day, um, it's obviously here to help you. Um, it's, it's, it's not something that, well, if you receive that email, it doesn't mean that your patch doesn't get accepted. Um, it means that you have to fix something, but just don't be scared. Just look at what's going on, fix it briefly. For kernel CI, which is, in my opinion, a bit more interesting, um, this is catching issues dynamically, meaning that I mean, on, on Smash and the others, yeah, you're doing a lot of static analysis and preventing certain stupid mistakes, but kernel CI actually tests on the real hardware. Um, it tests on multiple devices and multiple SOCs, so you're sure that you're not causing any regression, and if anything happens, because it will happen, it also auto-bisects. Um, it's... Uh, not 100% smart, but it will reduce your, um, your time bashing your head on what went wrong by at least 50%, at minimum 50%. And regarding the Colabra MediaTek integration kernel, that's a mostly feature complete uh, kernel that is always based on Linux Next, so you know, that's gonna be the stablest of them all, right? And uh, yeah, we are, of course, testing that on kernel CI, so we test all the pieces together on the real hardware, and of course, well, we're not just testing it on kernel CI. I'm also testing it personally with my own hands um, on my own Chromebooks. Um, this is a development kernel, so it's always updated. And it's open to everyone, so if anyone wants to use this kernel, you can find it on our GitLab. Uh, you're free to use it. You're free to contribute in case you want. It's, it's up to you. Um, that's um, in case you want to port any MediaTek uh, SOC, any MediaTek platform, any new MediaTek platform uh, upstream, you will probably find Nice goodies in this integration branch, which will, will help you out quite a bit in some cases. And that's about it. Thank you for being here. If there's uh, any questions, please. I have two questions. Uh, one of them, uh, the MediaTek X29 support, how does that look? Do you know? 
the X29 is uh, for smartphones, right? That's correct, yeah. So it should be your domain, I guess. Uh, there is some support uh, for the X29, um, but that's, uh, that's because of the legacy that we have in the kernel. So it's not directly supported, but um, it's going to be relatively easy to, to add it. And the other question is uh, GPU support on these devices, these mobile devices. How does that look? Um, well, I've been upstreaming one, that is the MT6795, uh, quite recently. Mm, currently upstream, uh, I'm waiting for some, uh, some series to, to get picked. Uh, but on, on, my, on my tree, I have basically everything working. The only thing that is not working is the modem. Uh, because I didn't have time to look into it. And um, what else? Oh, the battery charging. That's quite important. I understand that. Um, there's a um, huge discussion that we can do about battery charging. Um, and uh, well, that's, that's one of the devices that uh, require Linux to manage any and every aspect of the battery charging. So. Um, you can imagine that's not really comfortable to <laughs> ride a driver for that. Hey, so the GPU actually works on these devices. Is that the Mali GPU or is this something else? Um, the 6795, that's uh, PowerVR. But uh, all the Chromebooks, apart from the MT8173, uh, so MT8183, MT8192, 95, um, they are all on Mali GPUs. Uh, the last one, that is 8195, is on Valhall architecture. Okay. And yes, that, that works fine. Cool, thanks. On oh, Panfrost, that is. Thanks for your talk. So uh, you mentioned that you have access to some code drops from Mediatek and vendors. Um, where they have like the reference source code. Um, I think this has been like a um, long time issue with MediaTek that they didn't respect the GPL. Now we're seeing that um, since they started working with Google, they are kind of improving on that. Um, can you comment on like whether they now release publicly um, code SDKs um, for new platforms? Do they do you it can, for? You can find uh, MediaTek's code um, around. Uh, right. Now, uh, well, for um, for Chromebooks, you can find them on the Google Git. So, well, that that was obvious. But um, they're becoming more and more open. Um, they're not really breaking the GPL as they were doing before, uh, which was poor. Um, you can probably find easily um, some uh, some MediaTek kernels for smartphones um, on on GitHub. They but don't have something like Qualcomm, though. No. Right, yeah, so is it like people who happen to find it and release it, or is it actually the vendors? No, it's the vendors. Oh, okay. All it's right. the vendors. Good. There's um, a, at least Xiaomi that I know that uh, actually releases the kernels with Git history um, on GitHub. Uh, they sometimes miss some device, but it's, it's slow, but it gets there anyway. Okay, I have a second question, if I may, um, cool. which is about um, secure and well signed boot essentially. So, uh, MediaTek SOCs have also been known um, for shipping with fuses enabled that don't allow you to install your own bootloader. So you have to use something pre-signed with their keys, which is non-free. So this has been a, uh, also a huge issue in general um, for free software. Um, I know that the SOCs that Google use uh, are not signed; they don't have this problem. Uh, do you have any idea if MediaTek is now selling these kind of non-signed chips um, in the wild, if they have like development boards with those versions of the chips, or what's the general situation about that? There are some uh, IoT boards from MediaTek. Um, obtaining them can be done uh, by the regular consumer. Uh, you don't have to be a big industry. Um, it's, um, it's not really straightforward, but that's uh, for, for SOMs and, and such, it's never been really that much straightforward, unless it's a Raspberry Pi, anyway. Um, but yes, uh, these, these kind of boards are accepting unsigned code. 
So there is a lot of freedom um, in case you want to use one of those boards. All right, thanks. Thank you. Hey, I just wanted to do a plug for a tool called Patman, which will send your patches and check them and so on. I'm surprised how no one's, no, a few people have heard of it. Uh, anyway, um, do you know what bootloader they're using on the phones and, and have you got involved in that side of things or is it simply just reusing whatever's there? No, I have uh, never been involved in um, the early boot chain for, for smartphones. I've made my own research and uh, from what I have understood, they are using LK, little kernel. That's a very, very old bootloader, at least on old platforms. Um, I really don't know if they are using any kind of UEFI, uh, EFI, sorry, um, newest, uh, newer um, smartphones like Qualcomm does. Um, I literally have no idea. Um, but I'm sure that uh, both from the firmware perspective and uh, the actual bootloader, the smartphones and Chromebooks do differ. Though, um, I can tell you that the um, evaluation boards and the SOMs and demo boards and um, SBCs that are obtainable from MediaTek, they use the, the same bootloaders and the same boot chain as uh, the Android um, smartphones. Thank you. Sure. When nobody asks questions, that means that you have been exhausted, right? <laughs> <laughs> it also means it's nearly lunchtime. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so uh, thank you much. Uh, that was a fantastic talk. I uh, learned a lot more about um, MediaTek than, than I ever knew before, so thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks.